Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 385 for Tuesday, June 6th, 2023. <music> Greetings, folks. And welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. Sponsor for this episode is Super Mega Ultra Groovy with CapoApp.com, your song learning superpower. We'll talk more in depth about how that all works in a little bit. For now, just finished with fling rehearsal three feet away from where I'm sitting in the podcast desk in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. And for now, just getting ready to go to Paul Kent Band Rehearsal. In the Orchid, California, it's Paul Kent. In yeah, man. The Pomo. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There you go. It's we are squeezing this in between uh band rehearsals, which is uh, it's a great thing. I I um you talked years ago, uh, you said something about uh, we we were talking about rehearsals and I I was saying how important it is to like have the sound perfect for a rehearsal. I uh years ago, 3 years ago, almost to the day, um uh, certainly to the month I, I rejiggered my studio here and went all digital. I got that personas quantum 26, 26, uh, which has the capability of doing 26 ins and outs. It has eight of each on it. Uh, well, I guess 10, cause it's got the SP diffs, but then I bought some, you know, breakout devices, a Scarlet thing and a Behringer thing that I connect with the fiber optic cables. And, uh, and that gives me 24 XLR in and outs that I can do for recording and rehearsing and all that stuff. And we got here to rehearse for Bitter Pill rehearsal two days ago on Sunday, and things were being weird. There was like a, a like a, a routine noisy sound, and then it turned out that like I couldn't connect to one of those devices. I was able to make rehearsal work, but I couldn't hear my drums in my ears. And it reminded me of how important it is to have good sound. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it was fine. Like we made it through the rehearsal. Thank goodness. The it, And it's either a bad optical cable or, or a bad, um, you know, breakout box uh, thing that, you know, gives me my extra channels. I, I ordered a new cable. It was supposed to arrive today, but I'll find out tomorrow whether it's the cable or if I need to buy a new box. But uh, it, yeah, it was, you know, and then I had to do fling rehearsal the same way. And, and that band, everybody's on ears. So it was like, oh yeah, we can't hear drums. And I was mm. like, yep, that's just how it be for today. But you know, it's just one of those things of, of, I don't know. I'm, I'm a, I think the rehearsal room should like, I think putting the time in and making sure the rehearsal room sounds good is like, that's the best sounding environment you're ever going to get. As far as I'm concerned. I don't know. That's, that's my thing. I don't know. I, I can't relate too much to this because sound is a, a war of attrition in, in, uh, with the house rockers. It's a, even in rehearsal. Band. Totally, man. It, oh. It's a um, 10 piece band in a garage uh, and we were, we're too loud. Uh, we have Nick put better equipment in there. So, you know, the vocals can get above, but I wouldn't say we're hearing a lot of nuance and, and wow. uh, you know, yeah. Yeah. I like to me, and especially with the two bands that I mentioned with bitter pill and fling, like, it, you know, we were mostly working out new songs, like uh, collaborating on, putting together new arrangements for songs that people have written, like learning songs that people have written together. And so, you know, hearing each other for harmonies, it's not just, well, I know what my harmony is and I just need to sing it. And I know I, I trust that it will blend. It's like, no, I have no idea if this is going to work. We need to figure out what the harmonies are for this song and then learn them. Right. So mm. that idea of being able to hear is, uh, yeah, it, like it's, <laughs> I can't, it would be impossible to do what we do if we couldn't hear. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't mind rehearsing within ears. I mean, why not? I, I think it's, I, I mean, I, I can't imagine rehearsing without in ears because yeah. there is the, there is the benefit of having, being able to hear in rehearsal, but then there is also the functional benefit of rehearsing using in ears. I'm not saying having rehearsal with in-ears, but rehearsing the, the practice of using in-ears and, and just getting better with that. Just like we, you know, practice our instruments and all of that stuff. There's, 
There is a skill to using in-ears and any opportunity, you know, it's like everything. More reps means, you know, you get better with it. You, you know, you get more used to it. You learn how to dial it in better. All of those, you know, all those things. I, so so here's my current reflection on in-ears. So I haven't had monitors in a long time. And, and um, I'm pretty much with the house rockers. I'm pretty much on in-ears. It is still 75% of the time for different reasons, a unsatisfying thing. Yeah, it does save my voice because you sure. know, I can at least fight through all of the variables to hear myself clearly enough that I'm not screaming, which is you know a, a big win. But that's a big win. A good yeah. example. <laughs> yeah, we played a big festival uh, a week ago Sunday, so, so we're doing this on Monday. No, a week ago, a week ago today, uh, Memorial Day festival, and the thing that we fight more often than anything else are wireless problems. The syncing of the wireless oh, um, packs yep. and Wi-Fi, you know, so the guys can mix themselves, right? Yep. That That is more of a problem. Here's a problem that I had last week. Um, all of a sudden, the pack, uh, the volume would swell un, unbearably, right? Oh, that's not or acceptable. Drop out, oh, no. Or drop out. Yeah. Right? And, you know, my poor sound guy is trying to take care of 10 guys, you know, and, and deal with some things, especially when we do a festival, we don't really get a sound check. We just got 20 minutes to get, get on, get line check and go. Right. Yeah, right. But this was, this was brutal. And then we took a break and he rescanned the pack in the second half. Second set was just fine, but it's those types of things mm. that are really awful. So I get the good parts of it. And when it's good, it's really a delight. And I, for lack of a better word, I just am prepared that it's, is your it's better than is your guitar uh, wireless these days? Yes, or? it is. Okay, because I was going to say, like the guys in Fling, I expected when they all moved to in ears, I expected that they would pretty quickly move to wireless belt packs for in ears. Behind the drums, I have a wireless belt pack that I've had for I don't know, probably fifteen years. It's it's certainly not one of the state of the art ones. It was back then, but. I don't use it because it's one more battery to manage and I don't need to manage a battery because in general, I don't really leave the drum kit. Even also when a I, more frequency, you know, it, band right. There's all kinds about. of things to fight. Right. And I, I, I just get to avoid that by plugging directly in. And every single one of the guys in fling has solved this problem for themselves by not buying a belt pack, but instead by, you know, building a bundle so that their guitar cable, and their in-ear cable is is together, so they only really have one cable going, you know, between their instrument and and their you know between their body and their their station, if you will. But they're all on wired in-ears. Yeah, and we we are I'm, on big stages and going all over the place. I mean, yeah, I mean, so is it, playing. Like, I mean, it's it, it's not it's not like we're crammed in. Like, we played a pretty big stage what two weeks ago, and mm. they just you know, I mean. How far are you going? If your guitar cable can make it, you're good to go. You know, I mean, it's, no, guitar, got, that's what I'm saying. I'm on wireless guitars. Well. Right, right. But I mean, you can like, you know, you can get a 25 foot guitar cable and, you know, mm. I don't know. I like, I, I expected them to want to have, you know, wireless capability. And, and they were all like, well, I, I don't want to put my guitar wireless. So there's no reason to like, I, I'm tied to a cable one way or another. So why not? Why, why add that headache? I'm like, oh, preach on brother. Like I, I'm with you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, you know, speaking about a little, here's a little gear gap stuff. So I told you I use this Bo, Bose gear and I love yeah, it. Right. Yeah. So I have my Bose tower thing, which actually I, I, my small band plays through that thing and it's great. But now I actually had to send it in to have some repairs done. And I also have like this little Bose S one pro, which is a little, it's a battery powered, Kind of a busking speaker, but it sounds it's a awesome. Great right? speaker, I've seen those. Yeah, great speaker. So they just came out with the newest version, the S1 Pro Plus. Okay, it's similar in specs in many ways, a little bit lighter. But the thing that's really interesting to me is they built in two wireless receivers, and you can buy a wireless quarter inch or a wireless XLR. But the receiver part of it is already built in. So the transmitter part, oh. you buy, you know, 150 bucks. And this is actually something I thought was really interesting. And I don't know why more. I Probably line six gives you an option to buy, you know, wireless right into the amp. But it just seems like this is one of those 
functions that people want. It's like, why aren't tuners more? Why are tuners a separate thing now? Why aren't right. tuners? Why isn't that built included? into everything? Yeah. In, into everything, right? Yeah. So um, anyway, this S1 Pro Plus oh. has two wireless channels built into it and uh, kind of cool. That's pretty cool. Oh yeah, I'm looking at it here. So I, battery powered plus wireless guitar and wireless. But so literally, you could just if you want to busk, it's all you need. Right. You know, you, right. Uh, that's pretty good. Huh. I like this. All right. Yeah. yeah, man. Huh. That's pretty good. I like this. Yeah, yeah. So I want to catch you up on uh, you know, I share that we are having a little turmoil because my my drummer isn't well. And I have to do some subs, right? So we've had some gigs and I wanted to catch you up on. on yeah, how's that going? There. Yeah. Well, the first one was a week ago, Saturday. And um, it was a guy who is a friend of mine. He's my drummer down here on the Central Coast. He learned the show, no rehearsal. We, there was no time. Right. No opportunity. Right. Learned the show as best as he could. And, he came, and you know what? He did a damn good job. I mean, Woo-hoo! it was Whatever you whatever you think that might sound like, it was it was several clicks better than that because right. he put in a fair amount of time, put in an effort. Like all this, all the stops weren't clean, all the all the endings weren't clean or anything like that. But but we got through it. People, you know, enjoyed the show, and so that was good. And then the next gig, the one I was talking about before, where I was having the wireless problems, uh, our old drummer is available, and he's going to do most of the subbing for us. Oh, that's that's handy. Okay, so and he he yeah. you know it was butter. I mean, and, and his. This first gig that we did was a little nerve wracking because it was kind of our kickoff of our summer stuff. We haven't played in about six weeks together. You know, we'd put in a lot of time on some new material and, you know, there was, we really, for that drummer, we had to take the simplest material that we could do. Some some of it he put some time into, but mostly I tried to do a set list that we could get through. Right. Russ still had all his notes and, you know, was still. Yeah. He knew the show. Right. Yeah. Knew the show. So he, he walked in. So the first show was a little nervous. And even that first show. So it was a fair ways away from everybody. It's five hours for me. It was two plus hours for the guys in the Bay area in, and then there was Memorial day weekend traffic. So, so some of the guys were late and the drummer, we didn't really get a private sound check to kind of talk through anything. The drummer wanted the, 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 place was about a third full when the last guys got there for setup and it was just stressful. So new guy, people late, Ooh. hadn't played together in a while. Just, you know, all those kind of nerves, like, you know, I where, mean, that where would tense. be fine if you went into the gig with everyone expecting to be a pickup band for the night. Right. Like, I, that, like what you just described is something I've been through countless times where it's like, Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, Hey man, nice to meet you. You know, that, that sort of thing. And I, like, I know a lot of you folks who listen have sent in to feedback at giggabpodcast.com about that, but that's not what your band is. This <laughs> so well, yeah. So imagine this is like eight hundred to a thousand people in lawn chairs facing us, waiting for us to do what we did for them with a very polished band the year before, right? Yeah. So you know they invited us back out to play this special gig, and expectations were high. So it was quite nerve wracking, and and the first four songs. Uh, again, he did a great job drumming, but everybody's adrenaline was pretty high. And, and the first four songs, the tempos were really pushing. And we had to get everybody to take a breath and, you know, calm down and slow down. And uh, But we got through it. So that was good. And then a day off. And the next day, you know, we were somewhat happy we got through it because people liked it on the Saturday. But by the Monday, having Russ back and just really playing a clean show yeah. was a really good thing. But, uh, man... Well, I, and I say a clean show again, 20, 25 minutes to get the band on stage, you know, mic'd, line checked, ready to go. And we hadn't played with Russ in three or four years. So even though, you know, we were looking forward to it and assumed he would be great, there's in the back of your mind, you're like, well, this, we, have, we don't know. It's been a long time. So that was a bit of a nerve, a nerve wracking weekend that ended up okay in all ways. And Russ has played this, several gigs with us since then. Yeah. And it was great. We had a big gig last weekend. On Saturday, really big gig, and lots, lots of people there uh, in the town where we were most known, and it was just a, it was just a blast. Uh, and I'll tell you the interesting thing about that gig. Yeah, when we play a festival, we're usually playing after another cover band, right? Right, right, right. The bill for this festival last Saturday, just a couple of days ago, it was a um, Gypsy Jazz group, phenomenal, phenomenal, you know, group. And then it was an original funk band of insanely great players. Like 
I don't remember ever sitting there watching the band before us going, Ooh, you know, can, can we go over after these guys? Cause they were yeah. really good, huh. really, really good. But it was original music. It was funk. There was like a lot of like extended passages. If it, if it was, if it was in a day of listening music, they would have, and they did shine. I mean, people really liked sure, them. Sure. But you know, then we come on and play Earth, Wind, and Fire and Bruno Mars, and you know that's what people were there for. Got it. And again, town. So, but it was that. I, like I said, I haven't had that feeling watching a band before me in a while. Going, these guys are freaking uh -oh. good. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh oh. <laughs> like, are we gonna be all right? I do like that feeling. I, I I mean, part of me likes it where it's like, okay, well, now we got to go and deliver too, right? Like, I, I love that that sort of everybody pushing everybody forward and and making for a good show. But but yeah, there is there's two sides to that, you know, particular coin, I suppose, right? <laughs> All right, look, I get to tell you about our sponsor, Capo, from the folks at Super Mega Ultra Groovy. Capo is our go-to app for learning music by ear, right? Using traditional music and video players like Spotify or Apple Music or YouTube makes it really hard to move around a song, find that right spot you want to hear again, loop it, all of that stuff. Like they're, they're built to just listen to music the normal way. And when we're learning songs, we don't want it the normal way. We want it the Capo way because Capo gives us song learning superpowers. For example, Capo's transcription playhead gives precise control over that playback start point and helps us learn in chunks. And you can even slow down playback and it sounds spectacular because of Capo's high-end studio quality audio stretching technology. Sometimes I wish I could stretch audio in the middle of a performance to get a part right, but you know, Capo's really not built to do that because it can't change the laws of physics, but it can almost do it. It can do all kinds of things, right? It can detect chords, it can detect beats, and it's completely free. There's no account sign up, no ads, no sneaky free trial. You just go check it out. Visit capoapp.com or search for Capo, C-A-P-O, in the App Store. Works on the Mac, iPhone, or iPad. Again, Capo by Super Mega Ultra Groovy at capoapp.com. And our thanks to Capo for sponsoring this episode. And while I got you here, have you ever felt the hassle of swapping between different shows just to savor your favorite mix of genres when you're listening? Well, say hello to your new favorite audio hub, Cool.fm, K E W L.fm. At cool.fm, they get it. You love the diversity swinging between adult pop, modern country, classic hits. So they thought, why not bundle it all in one place? They have woven all these three popular genres into a single dynamic audio adventure, keeping your earbuds on their toes. But here's the twist they're not just about the music. Cool FM's lively DJs aren't your typical hosts. They're true entertainers. They share stories. They add personality. They ensure your listening experience is nothing short of spectacular. Need more spice? Check out their Saturday night dance party episodes where they spin everything from disco to hip hop and even throw in a country hoedown. And brace yourselves because twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays when they play those once chart topping hits that have been lost in the sands of time. The cherry on top? Cool.fm is everywhere you are. Online at kewl.fm or on your iPhone or Android via their app or through the Live 365 app. And they're perfectly synced with all the systems like Alexa, Sonos, and more. So, podcast listeners, gear up for the cool experience that's got everything. Visit kewl.fm today. That's cool.fm. And we'd like to thank them for doing this swap with us. So, it's Paul, cool. you, were, um, you were talking about uh, tempos on stage. And uh, I had, well, I was supposed to have a gig on Saturday with Uptown, the first gig that Uptown would have had in years. A new bass player, new singer, many songs that we had played before, but many songs that were new to the band and quite a few of them even new to me. Like the first time I had ever played, like um, uh, we had that, that rock set song, The Look is in there. You know, She's got the look, you know, like there's some fun songs, but songs that were new to me. And so... Uh, I was thinking about tempos on stage as well. And it's like, and even in the rehearsal room, like a lot of our rehearsals, I found myself saying, Hey, wait, wait, let me listen to the the song quick on my phone. Okay. Yeah. There's the tempo. All right. Let's like, now let's go. And uh, so I started thinking about how am I going to make sure that we don't have tempo problems 
you know, all over the place with songs that just aren't in my brain. Like I don't know these tempos and certainly in my charts, I can put the metronome marking for it. And that helps me get close. I can, I, you know, I can see, you know, it's, it's 160 or it's, it's, you know, 110 or whatever. But I thought, you know, I have technology here. I use the app called on song, which is great. It lets me build set lists and all this other stuff, but you can put per song, you can put the tempo that the song is and you can set whether the metronome runs forever once you start it or only for like 20 measures once you start it. So I set everything. I set the tempo for everything. And I set it for 20 measures. And you can also set whether it's going to make an audible click or a visible click. And it, it flashes the outside of my iPad, like the, like not the outside of it, but like the border of the screen. And it's perfect. So I had, I had this ready to go and I had actually used it for our, our rehearsal leading up to the gig. And I had had it ready to go and I was all set to come into the show and talk about what success I had had with it. And then, uh, even though it was a rain or shine gig, it wasn't rain or shine or super high winds at the beach gig. So on Saturday morning, it was canceled. It was a, a it was called Ride for Alzheimer's. It was a, a long bike ride raising money for Alzheimer's. And they decided having people ride along the beach when it was like 50 knots or something mm. it was super dangerous. And I, I don't disagree. <laughs> so we did not get to play the gig, but I, I'm curious uh, for anybody listening, but I, I'll ask you too, Paul, but anybody listening, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. What do you, like, how do you address this issue on stage? Do you just go with what you feel? Or when you're adding new songs, do you have somebody on stage who has a metronome or or some way of getting a tempo reference before jumping off to the tune? Do you guys do any of that? Well, there's a few answers. So Russ used to actually put metronome markings Right. But in, in our band, I count many of the songs off sure. live on mic. Right. Yep. So a lar large, a large part of it is on me. And I definitely have over the years had to remind myself to take a second and, and reality check my feel as to where I am. That right? second of feeling the tempo in your body before you like, if, if you're just feeling it in your head, it, that's not enough. I find yeah. I got to like move my body to the tempo. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, but, and, and it's not perfect. I was just listening to the show we just did last weekend and which I thought was really good. And I'm listening to it and go like, man, we were, we were pushing it. Yeah. So, oh, I mean, but in a normal show, eight times out of 10, I think we're pretty close. I'm pretty close, mm -hmm. you know, in getting us in there. And then there's also, you know, when my drummer and I are in good sync, he'll, he'll know when I count something off, if it's fast, and he'll just play it at the he'll right just tempo. just play it at it. the right tempo. Right. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I always give myself, even if I'm the one that counted it off, like if I don't take that minute, you know, to, to feel it in my body before I start the tune, if I just start or whatever, and it's like, oh, crap, this is too fast. I always give myself, if, if it's a dancing crowd, I give myself four measures to fix it. Once we're in past four measures, if people are dancing, it's like, you know what? Unless, unless this is a total train wreck for some reason, we're just going to live with it for today. You know, yeah. it, it, yep. I think you kind of, I, I don't know. That's my, that's been my experience with it. Um, and that's worked out. Okay. It, I mean, it's, you know, it's not great to have to play a whole song at the wrong tempo, uh, you know, more than five BPM in either direction. And sometimes even that can be yeah. bad, but uh, changing while people are up and moving. No, like you just got to live with it sometimes. Yeah. You got to live with it. Yeah. Which sucks. <laughs> it hey, I um, want to tell you about a very, yeah. very interesting conversation I had with, with my Northern California, Paul Kent band. So this is the band I've referred to on this show as my coffee house band, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 This, this was like the, the black heart city road show or something band sort of distilled well, some down of the guys into this, were, right? Well, sort of. Yeah. Some of the guys are that I know from, from when I had Black uh, Black Sunday Road Show. Black Sunday Road Show. I knew there was a name. Yeah, there. yeah, I got close. Yeah, yeah. So that was that was a sixteen piece Americana band, and, right? And this is definitely not a sixteen piece band. But the four of us were, you know, th three of the guys who I grabbed were in that band, including you and my very good friend Chris Breen. Right. So that band has gotten really fun. I mean, we like each other. It's different types of music. People react to it really well. 
And I'll come back to the types of music because it's another kind of interesting dilemma. But we just did, you know, we played basically once a month at the coffee house for the past, you know, since we're back out of pandemic, right? Sure. And the band is kind of gelled. So it's me on guitar, we have a violin, we have a, a drummer who can play small, small rooms, you know, kind of more brushes or hand percussion type things, uh, a great bass player and Chris on, on keyboards. And the bass player and Chris can sing harmony really well. We do not, we had one practice because we had one really difficult song that we wanted to that we wanted to give some polish to. But the general idea is I send out songs, the gig start at seven, and we do a little sound check from six to six forty five where we run through some stuff. It's not, you know, there are people in the coffee house and that's fine. But it, it just works really well. And again, super nice guys. Great, 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 great players. And we're just all kind of digging the music and and you know the chemistry and so it's going really well we just played our first gig not at the coffee house so it was outdoors at a winery on sunday ah. and it was just awesome i mean it was just a great day we actually weren't on this little cramped coffee house stage right right we got yeah. to and we got to you know we could really hear each other dynamics kind of came through and everything was great so it a, a discussion ensued about you know you know do we want to do more of this stuff and the perspectives are really interesting. So Chris is a band leader of his own. So he's got another band. I don't play a ton, but that's been his band for many, many years. And that's his, that's the way he phrased it is I've given the coffee house Fridays because they're booked for a year in advance. That is locked into my calendar. But, you know, on a Saturday night, if my band gets a decent gig, you know, probably any gig, you know, I, I would probably have to prioritize that. Yep. So then there was an ensuing discussion, discussion, about priorities. The bass player also plays in two other bands, you know, really good. Um, the violin player plays in one other group, but it gets called because he's one of the better violin players around. And the drummer is just recently retired from his day job and he's really enjoying what this is. But again, it was very constructive discussion. And I said, listen, if availability becomes to be a problem, I don't really want to go through this sub thing. It's not, you know, this, this group yeah, works right, well. Right, if right. we end up only being those Friday nights, you know, that's not the worst thing in the world, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. And then there was a little bit of a conversation about pay, which, you know, we touch on pay, you know, often, often on this show. Yeah. First thing I want to share is Chris um, shared a quote that he has used in his life about, he, he used to be a, um, professional musician playing piano, a like grand piano in a Nordstrom's fancy department store was his kind and, of regular gig. And he bought that piano from Nordstrom's yes, too. Yes. And I, I use the good, term good bought, other story. It, which is a whole different story. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. 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 Anyway, he said that the store manager, you know, came up and was giving him, you know, wh why do musicians get paid so much? He said he was making 25 bucks an hour, which back in the seventies was pretty good money. Right. Sure. Anyway, his answer is just perfect. He said, well, if I wanted to learn your job, it would take me six months. If you wanted to learn my job, it would take you 25 years. Oh. <laughs> is that perfect? Oh, wow. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And the way Chris plays, he can back that up. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. So anyway, then we went wow. on and we're talking about. <laughs> I'm, how, how have I, like he and I have had a lot of, you know, those, those sort of backstage gig gabs, right? Like these conversations, you know, as, as, as everybody listening knows, or at least musicians listening know, these are the kind of conversations that happen backstage. We just decided to record them and, and turn them into a podcast and schedule the recordings. <laughs> we, we do, we do a pretty good job at the first part, the scheduling of it, not so good. So thanks for waiting two weeks on this episode, folks. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we do what we can, but, um, how have I never heard Chris, like what a brilliant quote. I definitely yeah. have never heard him share that before. So that's yeah. amazing. So if it. you use that out there in podcast land, credit the great Chris Breen. The great anyway, Chris Breen. Yeah. And then the discussion was like, okay, you know, that's availability. Let me do a reality check about money. So the, the type of music this band plays is kind of acoustic based rock. A lot of it is kind of slower tempos, very airy, very dynamic, heavy. We have, a, we have, about a set of upbeat stuff, you know, that we usually do at the end of our show. And it actually started out as a sing-along band. So we like to have some Beatles stuff and, you know, happy together by the turtles and that type of thing. So, so we got to play on a, on a bigger forum and got to turn up a little bit and 
you know, space out a little bit and and hear each other. And it was just such a pleasant thing. But we're, we're not going to get hired as a party band, right? Mm-hmm. We're not going to get hired when people want jazz and truly want background music. Right. You know, it's, it's vocal music largely. And so this is listening the coffee music. house. Yeah. It's listening music. And, and, you know, so I, I love, said, I love playing listening music. It's one of my favorite things. Yeah. Well, remember the coffee house is everybody's facing us and, it, and they're basically little mini concerts every, every time we play. So that vibe has always worked. And even at the, at tasting rooms, and wineries where people are sitting in chairs and have their glass of wine. Largely, they're listening. Not everybody, but I mean, right. it's conducive to this. But again, we're not like usually when people want to when they want background music, they will hire a jazz you know combo of some kind, right? But this music wouldn't do very well for that. I mean, I, I, I don't think I could sing it with, with plates clinking or you know large groups of people talking yeah. over what we're trying to do. So, so we said, you know, listen, there's not a lot of very specific places that we're going to get hired to play this music. The wineries and tasting rooms, luckily where we live, there's enough of those that we could probably do more of this if we wanted to. But, you know, the two, the gig that, that is, it used to be a solo gig of mine. And I said to the guy who booked me, I said, you know, if I bring my band out, can you kick in a little money? Cause I don't have budget for it now, but you know, if you want to do it, feel so I just basically, it was almost out of pocket to, to get the band this gig just to see what would happen. Right. Sure. Yep. I got you. Yeah. So anyway, conversation about money and, and uh, you know, th- this is where Chris made his quote and the guys somewhat universally said, listen, if a casual or a private wants to hire us and it's not going to be, you know, terribly fun to do it, if they expect us to be background music, we can do it. You know, that we're not adverse to money, but you know, they should pay, you know, fair gut per, per musician fee. Right. Yes. And the number we came to is, is a, is a, a floor of 300 bucks per man. Right. Okay. So that would be, it's pretty you know, good. We're not going to even yeah. start there. You know, we're not even going to have the conversation because it's no fun to play James Taylor when people are you know screaming over you. Right. Right. So, but the guys all universally said, I'm not thrilled. I, you know, I think music has value and I think I should be paid for it, but I can justify in my mind a hundred bucks a head. If it's a, you know, a place that is creatively conducive, you know, to enjoying the act of making, making music. Sure. And so, so, and, and again, right now, solo acts are pretty popular at these wineries and um, people playing to tracks are, are pretty popular at these wineries if someone wants a beat to dance or something like that. But, you know, they're really, we're not a classic rock band, kind of an acoustic pop band, I guess, would be closest to it. But so it's just interesting. We are really enjoying playing this music. We enjoy playing together. Um, but all those different, again, you know, experienced, talented in demand musician saying, I would like to put some level of priority on doing this. If it's the right place, I can actually be more flexible. What I think the value of it is because it has intrinsic creative value to me, artistic value to me. Sure. And if it's not that, you know, let's make sure we get paid. And so we kind of danced around that conversation. It was is it just- realistic for, I'm going to ask the question. A lot of people listening are thinking, is it realistic for this band to get paid? You know, you said there was six people in the band. Is that right? Five. Five. So 1500 bucks for a gig. If, if it's the, you know, the, the, like, could this band, you've played $1,500 gigs with the house rockers. You played gigs for more. I think you've probably played gigs for less. Like, is it realistic for this band to, to go and play $1,500 gigs that are the, you know, we've got to play and do the thing and you know, what you describe realistic that, that there will be that type of work or realistic yeah. that the band would want to do them. No, no. I know the band would want to do them. Is it realistic for the band to get that kind of work? Um, we're going to find out. So, okay. you know, that was the nice thing about having this conversation is like, you know, where, what are you, what are your priorities? What are your ceilings? How does this group have priorities amongst other things that you might be doing? And it was just good to kind of flesh that out. So the answer to that is a, I have a, you know, decent name and reputation some, and, and I've been doing this acoustic thing for almost as long as I've been doing the house rocker thing. Yeah, yeah. So I think some things will come up. Are we going to sure. work twice a week, every weekend? No. Well, right. But yeah, but, you know, I don't think 1500 
you know, for anything private is out of the, is out of the question. Oh, that's right? fair. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just, yeah. Okay. It's not, it's not club money, you know, clubs right. in general aren't going to pay that. Right. 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 Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, but you know, the harder task is these tasting rooms aren't really paying five, 600 bucks for anything. And so how to, how to get that money up the right ones, you know, like I've had, there's one really big winery where I, I've had a $600 tip day. Right. So, you know, that, yeah, there's that amount of people there. So um, we'll see, but you, we're, we're, we have a lot of desire to play this beautiful music, but we want to play it where people will be able to hear it and enjoy it. And so we, you know, we're on the search for the right fit and it's very different. Again, if you, Come out with a you know rock and roll fake book. You can still work. You know, you lots of bars, lots of dive bars, dance clubs. You know, there are house parties, block parties. There are all different types of things that that you know classic rock cover bands can find. But this music is a little harder because it's not dance music per se, and um, yeah, it just has to be the right environment for the for the music to go over. As the, I'm sure there's many you know genres of music that that fits as well. You can't compare everything to what a classic rock cover band right. might be doing for work. Oh yeah, no, it's all it, everything's different, right? No, I I get that. I, yeah, all right, yeah, cool. You um, as we've been having this conversation, I've been thinking. You know, obviously, I've been playing uh, with mostly original bands lately. I have the Uptown thing going, but um, that gig was was nixed on Saturday. <laughs> Although we have a couple more coming up, which is which I'm looking cool. forward to. It, like, it's a good band. Everybody gets along really well. But I we had a, a fling gig a couple of weeks ago uh, where we wound up playing a few covers. You know, we 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 treat covers like our vanity songs, uh, where Ooh. we throw them in because we want to play them, and we wound up playing uh, "Already Gone" by the uh, by Eagles. Yeah, and we with the three of us, uh, Aaron sings the lead on that one, and the three of us, Jamie, Aaron, and I wound up hitting this harmony on the third verse that was just butter. <laughs> and it, no, I mean, it was like, it was like, okay, like, uh, wow. And there's a lot of resistance in fling um, from both Jamie, our bass player and Russ, our, our guitar player and fearless leader uh, to playing covers at all. And I think some of it comes from a, I, I, I don't mean to put words in anybody's mouth, but it, it, my interpretation is that they're concerned with, well, it's a slippery slope. We start playing too many covers and we just become a cover band. And, you know, we all really want to play originals. I don't think there's, I don't share their concern, but I understand it. I have been in original bands that have turned into cover bands before. So it is not a completely, you know, baseless concern. Yeah. I don't know that that's actually their concern, but I, I get it. Right. You know, so, but I, I see huge value in any band playing cover songs and, and there, there's, there's a lot of facets to it. One is what we experienced, you know, the other night where it's like, when we get to play a song where someone else has written the parts, right. And, and maybe like with, with already gone, certainly as a band, we didn't dissect those harmonies. We didn't, you know, we're not necessarily singing exactly what each member of the Eagles, you know, pulled together and sang for that. But these are songs that are in our DNA, especially that particular song. Like the Eagles is a a band that, you know, many of us in uh, Fling have spent time listening to and playing their songs or whatever. And uh, because of that, you come in with this knowledge. It's not like you have to figure out, oh, what harmonies work here now let's figure out how to sing them. It's you, you have the confidence of, I know this harmony works here. I, not only have I heard, you know, the Eagles do it, but I've done it myself in countless other scenarios. And now I have the confidence to just do it here. And that's a really valuable thing in terms of a band learning how to sing together but also learning how to craft our own harmonies together. Like what parts, yes, we all are confident about what the parts are, but it also turns out for that particular song, we can sing them and they sound really good when we blend like that. So it's like, Hey, wait a minute, let's take what we just learned there. Like that was butter. So, and I sent a note to the band afterwards. I was like, that was amazing. So first of all, let's always make sure we do that again. Like I, I, you know, that's that, that gets me off the couch. That was amazing. 
But B, let's also take that idea and apply it to the, this song we have called Saturday Tomorrow, where we do a similar thing in the third verse, but where it hasn't ever quite gelled the right way. We got it decently on tape. But I think on tape, it was mo- well tape, you know, on our recording on our EP, but it was mostly, I think Aaron sang a bunch of parts and we just layered them together and it was like, Oh, that sounds good. But, uh, but you know, we have to like figure out how to do these things live. And it was like, we can do it. We just did it here. Let's do that with this song. And everybody in the band, you know, including Jamie and Russ were like, yes, exactly. And, and I think even Jamie said, ah, now I see what you're saying about like, the covers being, you know, they're, they're also good just blocking and tackling, like just, you know, the, the kind of stuff where it's just like play music, learn how to play music together and and then worry about the 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 different stuff where you're, you know, you're creating music together. So um, let me ask you a question. Do, yeah, when you do covers, are they intentionally uh, redone to sound like you or do you just you play them and whatever comes out comes out? generally generally we just play them and whatever comes out comes out there are moments in any song where we will be like hey wait a minute let's rearrange this or let's at yeah. least discuss the arrangement so that we're all on the same page but sure um yeah i like in fling i don't think we've ever changed a cover so much that it becomes our own with bitter pill there's there's a couple of tunes that we will, you know, bitter pillify. Like we're playing this bikini kill song called Rebel Girl that is is very I, I, sort of different. I mean, it's different ish uh the way we do it. But but you know, but even that wasn't, hey, we should just change this whole wholeheartedly. It was like, all right, well, there's that song. Now let's play it as us and see what, you know, when you put that song through the machine of bitter pill or put that song through the machine of fling, what comes out the other side? And it is, I think that's it's going to be thing. different. Right. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so two things. One is I don't, I don't understand the like religious hard line about not playing covers. Everybody plays covers. All, you know, yeah. everybody plays covers, right? Yes. It's so, totally fine. Yeah. Right. I think it's, it's I think my it, feeling anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, on the house rockers, Facebook page, I posted somebody recorded just about all of the gig that we did last Saturday and broke it up into individual songs. Nice. including the band who I was talking about who played before us. So, yeah. hey, I'd love you to, like, they're, they're, it's super band, Collectivity. Collectivity is the name of the band, right? And they, they're kind of like heavier than Tower of Power, but with a lot of those kind of like syncopated lines. They had, they had two horns. Yeah. Um, all of them are amazing players. I'd love to hear what you think about the drummer because he blew us away. We were, we were watching from, you know, backstage. And we're like, holy crap. Um, he, very awesome. Carter Beaufort to me, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, you you know, I just like, but anyway, the point of this is serious original band with a couple albums out. Yep. They had, they had two Jimi Hendrix covers right. in, their, in their set, right? Oh, I would, I, and, I would, I would play a Jimi Hendrix cover in every gig I ever played. But it uh, just makes people yep. smile, that, that little moment of familiarity. And I actually think it buys you a little connection with an audience well, that's that's you know, it what bridges I, your show and yes and you know kind of get like you said you call it a vanity song it gives you it, it gives buys, the, it gives the audience a glimpse into what makes you tick like what yeah. do you like like you're you're playing yeah. them your songs and that's fine but even like let's say you're a country band right like most country musicians aren't just listening to country at home even if all of their, the art that they put out is country. Like they right. might be into rock and roll and, and, yep. and, and classical and who knows whatever else. Right. And so like seeing a band go and play like better pill, going to play a punk song. It's like, okay, like the, here it is. Like, Oh, like, or in the same shows we might play, you know, rebel girl will play Minnie the moocher. And all of those things fit because they are things that, you know, either we as a band collectively like, or members of the band are into, and nobody in the, I don't, I mean, well, there's, there was one song that, that somebody in the band vetoed, but, but in general, you know, we just play what we play and it's fine. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that, that idea of that connection and giving an audience a glimpse, it, it sort of lets the wall down a little bit. And it's like, Oh, Hey, wait, I know that song too. I like Hendrix. Huh? But it stitches your show together in yes. kind of an interesting way. Yes. You know, and that, that's why, that's why, I mean, name, name an artist that you like that, that hasn't done covers. So 
you know, drawing that that hard line. Even Zappa, who famously said, I don't listen to other people's music. I don't have time. I only have time to listen to like what I'm creating. Even Zappa played covers. Super so. cover of Stairway to Heaven. Super duper cover of Stairway Yeah. And Whipping Post. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's almost like he wrote it. He did not, by yeah. the way, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, cool. Yeah. You should take a listen. Let me know I what will. you think about this. And, you know, if you want to post a link or something like that, it's cool. But they were, they were a, <laughs> like I said, we have not stood side stage going, holy cow. I love we that. We feel we can hold our hand with just about any cover band, uh, hold our own with yeah. pretty much any cover band. But these guys were blowing the doors down and um it was kind of fun and yeah i mean we came out and you know it got our energy and our got, got our blood going then we gave a great show but yeah but it was uh it, i was mostly amused reflecting that i hadn't felt that moment like ooh, uh-oh <laughs> they say yeah this the bar the bar has gone up a little bit here yeah yeah i love that That's, it makes it from a it, it, it raises the stakes we talked you know a couple of months ago about low stakes gigs versus high stakes gigs and it was like suddenly this is a high stakes gig or higher than we thought yeah Cool. It was cool because they were all super good guys too. Well, I know you got to get off to your rehearsal. I don't want to keep you here. We could keep talking. I got to go. But you got to go. go. Listen, folks, thank you for hanging out with us. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com is where you are going to send in all your thoughts, whatever you might think. And by the way, I am using uh, uh, Isotope's RX-10 voice denoise on Paul's signal tonight to like dry things out a little let us know what you think feedback at giggabpodcast.com what do we say Paul always be performing later